Truth in History with Charles A. Jennings. Welcome to Truth in History. In this message, we want to take a look at the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Some years ago, I understand on the Jack Parr program, that's been a long time ago, one of his guests was a Christian woman, and he asked her, as a Christian, what do you believe? And her answer was, well, we don't believe in smoking or drinking. We don't believe in adultery. We don't believe in so forth and so on. And he said, now, wait a minute, ma'am. I didn't ask you what you didn't believe. I asked you what you do believe. So we must know what we do believe and why we believe. Now, many men have tried to disprove the Bible. There's been a bunch of them. That this Bible right here is full of errors. It's, it's not chronologi chronologically correct. It's uh, linguistically wrong. The events that are recorded in here could not have taken place. You know, the miracles were not really miracles. They were just acts of nature or the weather or something. But what about Jesus Christ? If the word is wrong, it's wrong within the minds of men because they have never experienced the author of the book. Now, we're going to take a look at the life of Jesus, the, the human fleshly life of the Lord Jesus. And why do we believe that he was divine? Was he the same as every other man? Or was his life totally different? In the book of John, we read in chapter 1, in verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. And then when we drop down to verse 14, it says, And the Word was made flesh, a flesh man, God in flesh. Was it 25% God? Was it 50%? Was it 75%? Was it 90%? Or was it 100% God? And the Word became flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, 100%. Timothy, in the book of Timothy, Paul writes that the God became flesh. God became flesh. So the person of Jesus Christ unusual, different from any other man that ever lived. He was 100% God and 100% man. Figure that one out. And his life, his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection and ascension, What other man experienced all that? None. So I would like to go over 10 different things in the life of Jesus that proves his deity, his divinity, that proves 
that he was the Word made flesh. And before I forget, I have a book here entitled The Book of, well, The Order of Melchizedek, mainly mentioned in the book of Psalms and in the book of Hebrews. But I've put in this, I have put this book together, The Order of Melchizedek, A Revelation of the King Priest Ministry of Christ. This, folks, is well worth, is well worth reading. And I, I encourage you to uh, contact us for the price for this book or an offering for this book because it's, it explores an area of the life of Christ and the principle by which he served to bring about our salvation. He had to be perfect. He had to be and fulfill that Melchizedek priesthood in order to bring about our salvation. And we offer this, uh, make this available for an offering to the ministry. Also, we have a magazine entitled Truth and History. This magazine is free to anyone who would contact us and request a copy. Now, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was then made flesh. How was it made flesh? It was made flesh through supernatural conception. We say that Jesus had, was born of a virgin, a virgin birth, but it was a virgin conception that Jesus had. So I'd like to give you 10 proofs, 10 biblical proofs of the deity of Jesus Christ. It tells us in Matthew chapter 1 and verse number 18, Matthew 1, 18, it tells us this. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When, as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Found with child of the Holy Ghost. In other words, the Holy Ghost was his father. But yet when we turn to Luke, the book of Luke chapter number one, and the angel speaking to Mary, it says in Luke 1, 35, and the angel answered and said unto her, that is Mary, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So was he the Son of God, or was he the Son of the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost is God. There's only one divine spirit. There's not two spirits. Jesus said in John 4 that God is spirit. Now the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit is spirit. So are there sp two spirits? No, there's only one divine spirit. So the Holy Ghost is God. But the Holy Ghost is spoken of in Scripture as that ability of God to communicate with man. He emanates from God to man. So the first proof that Jesus was divine, was a virgin conception and a virgin birth. Jesus Christ was conceived of the Holy Spirit, which is God himself, and born of the Virgin Mary, which made him the only begotten Son of God. Proof number one, the virgin conception, and birth of Jesus Christ. So if someone asks you, well, you're a Christian, what do you believe? The core of the gospel is a person. It's not a thing. It's not a set of principles. But the very 
purpose and the plan of God and the very focus of this book and the gospel is a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. So tell them, this is what I believe. Number one, Jesus Christ was conceived of the Holy Ghost. Proof number two, and that is his presentation at the temple. And when we turn to Luke chapter 2, we read in verses 21 through 38 concerning his presentation at the temple, and it tells us that there was a man in the temple, an elderly man by the name of Simeon. And in verse 25, it reads thus, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. I'm reading from the King James. The Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit was upon him. Now, the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit witnessed within Simeon that this child that was being carried by his mother was the consolation of Israel, the very Messiah that was promised to Israel in the book of Isaiah, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. A son is given. A babe is born, prophesied by that silver-tongued prophet Isaiah. And he says, this is going to be the Son of God, the consolation of Israel, that which Israel had been longing for for hundreds of years. And this man, it, the Holy Spirit within him, witnessed this little baby is the very Savior of my people Israel. Verse 26, and it was revealed unto him, how? By the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit, that he should not see death before he could see the Lord's Christ, or the Lord's anointed, or the Lord's Messiah. And he came by the Spirit. Man, this guy, this, this man, he was... He was walking in the Spirit, filled with the Spirit. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him after the custom of the law, Simeon took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy prophet or thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Some people translate this, that mine eyes have now seen Yahshua, or Yahweh's Christ, Yah's salvation. So here we go, proof number two, his presentation in the temple when he was just a few days old when he was just a few days old, a man filled with the Spirit of God. You know, I'm reminded of that verse, no man calleth Jesus Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Really, we need a new and a fresh revelation of Jesus Christ by the Spirit. We've got definitions, we've got 
our creeds, we've got our our uh, books that men have written, commentaries and so forth, which are good, but there's nothing like a revelation of who Jesus is by the Holy Spirit of God. Proof number two, his presentation in the temple. Number three, his water baptism. Now we can turn to the book of John or book of Matthew. Let's, let's, let's turn to Matthew chapter three. It tells us this. When John was baptizing, John the Baptist was baptizing people. And it says in verse number 13, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. And John said, Now wait a minute, Lord, I need to be baptized of you. I'm not worthy to baptize you. But Jesus said, let it be right now in order to fulfill all righteousness. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God. Here's the Spirit of God once again involved in the proof of who Jesus is. The Spirit of God in his birth, in his presentation at the temple, and now in his water baptism, the Spirit of God. See, the Word was made flesh by a supernatural act of the Spirit of God. And now, this is his birth, his first witness at, by Simeon, a man filled with the Spirit of God, and now his second witness by a man named John the Baptist at the baptism of Jesus. So his second witness, or his third witness, if we want to look at it that way, the, the witness of the angel to Mary, we'll say his, that was the first witness. Simeon was the second witness. John was the third witness, and all involved the Holy Spirit of God. This is what it says, And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and then this voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. That was his anointing. Wow, this is... This is Powerful stuff. It's, it's, boy, oh boy. And then the fourth proof of his deity was his wilderness temptation. Matthew chapter 4, verse number 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit. The fourth proof, and the Spirit of God was involved in that fourth proof. When Jesus could say, it is written. He said that three times. To Satan, the opposer, it is written. But he was led up of the Spirit of God. This was proof of his overcoming, his power to overcome temptation. His power to overcome temptation. Let me back up a little. His virgin birth, 
was his incarnation, the incarnation of God in flesh. His presentation in the temple with Simeon was his announcement that this is the Lord's Christ. His water baptism was his anointing. His wilderness temptation was his overcoming of evil and overcoming of all temptation. And then proof number four, his sinless life. I'm going to turn to Hebrews chapter four on this one. Hebrews chapter four and verse 15. This is what it says. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He lived a life without sin. Proof number four. Proof number five, excuse me. His, his birth, his temptation, his baptism, his wilderness temp temptation, and now his sinless life. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26 and 27. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice for his own sins, and then for the people. For this he did once when he offered up himself, because he was not a Levitical priest. He was a Melchizedek priest, and that's what this book is all about, that Jesus Christ was a Melchizedek priest, a perfect priest, a perfect person. He was tempted but yet without yielding to sin. So that's proof number five, his sinless life, his perfection. He was perfect in all things. Now, proof number six, that Jesus was divine that Jesus possessed the nature of divinity, and that is his miracles. In the book of Acts, we read Acts 10.38. 10.38 reads, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost. There we go. The Holy Spirit of God is now involved in his miracles. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. The Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit now anointed Jesus to do those miracles among the people, raising the dead, healing the sick, opening blind eyes, 
making the lame to walk, healing those that had palsy and all types of deformities. Folks, Jesus Christ, He and He alone can do those wondrous works. He can work through men, but He's the one that does the work. And what does this tell us? It tells us that He was approved of God. He was approved of God. It, in other words, his miracles was one proof that he was the Son of God. Also, we read in the book of John, chapter 5, verse 36. Chapter 5 and verse 36. This is what our Lord said concerning himself. He says, But I have a greater witness than that of John. See, John was one of his witnesses because John declared that he who came to him that was to come to him would be the Son of God. But I have a greater witness than that of John, for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. This is his approval. Then John 14, 11. John 14 and verse 11. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake, for the very miracles. He was telling the people, believe me for the very miracles that I do. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 22, ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by what means? Miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know and witness. His miracles was God's stamp of approval that Jesus was the Son of God. Proof number seven, his transfiguration. His transfiguration. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 27 is recorded this incident in the life of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration where Moses and Elijah appeared to him in glory. They saw his glory. Peter, James, and John also saw the glory of Christ. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son. Hear him. There's no other man ever experienced this. So this was his glorification. Because Peter, in his second book, said that we saw his glory. We saw him in his glory state, not just in his fleshly state, 
John said we could see and touch. We could touch him. But Peter records that he and John and James saw the Lord Jesus in his glorified state, talking with Moses and Elijah. Now that is proof number seven. And then his sacrificial death. Well, the Romans put a lot of people to death. They put numerous criminals to death in a most cruel manner. And they put our Lord to death in that same cruel manner by crucifixion. But what was different about our Lord's crucifixion? Many things, of course. And you're familiar with that. And he did it for us. But what made his blood sacrifice, the shedding of his blood, different from the two thieves? They shed their blood. Blood came out, dropped on the ground. Jesus' blood dropped on the ground. What made Jesus' blood any different? Hebrews chapter 9. Verse 11. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, referring to his body. His body was the tabernacle of God. Not made with hands. No. It was conceived and made by the Holy Ghost. That is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now, this reflects back to the Old Testament where the high priest once a year would go into the most holy place and sprinkle the Ark of the Covenant with the blood of an animal. That was the tabernacle. That was the most holy place. Not just the holy place, but the most holy place. But the writer of Hebrews tells us it wasn't by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. Remember in Matthew 26, 26, he said, drink this cup. This is my blood of the new covenant. That cup of the fruit of the vine represented his blood. And Hebrews, this writer says, by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place. He entered. That was his entrance into the holy place in the heavens, not in Herod's temple. No, Jesus never went into the holy place or the most holy place of Herod's temple. And besides, behind that second veil into the most holy place, it was empty. There was no Ark of the Covenant. There was no mercy seat and there was no glory cloud. It was empty. He couldn't have sprinkled anything he couldn't have sprinkled, sprinkled blood on anything. So he entered into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Verse 13, for, of the, for if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, 
referring back to the old covenant system, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself to God without spot? So how was his blood sprinkled in the most holy place in the heavens? It was by the Holy Spirit who through the eternal spirit offered himself to God. And in verse 12, it says he entered in once into the holy place. Now, this is beyond my comprehension. But this is one of the proofs that his death was different from any other human death. Our blood goes into the ground, but his blood, somehow, some way, I cannot explain it, by the eternal Spirit or the Holy Spirit, was sprinkled on the mercy seat in the heavens because the earthly tabernacle of the Old Testament was a pattern of the heavenly tabernacle, of the heavenly order. So Jesus Christ His blood, pure, pure blood, a man conceived of the Holy Ghost, but yet his flesh of the house of David, making him 100% man and 100% God. I cannot explain all these wonderful things. Proof number nine, his resurrection from the grave. The Bible tells us that he was crucified according to the scriptures and raised again from the dead, according to the scriptures. Romans chapter 1, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and to declare to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, the Spirit of God, by the resurrection from the dead. Wow. See, the Holy Spirit is, it was involved in his resurrection. The Holy Spirit was involved in his resurrection, the spirit of holiness. This is, this is like the psalmist said, too wonderful for me to understand and to comprehend. Folks, it's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. All this was done by the Spirit of God. That was proof number nine. Proof number 10, his ascension, his exaltation. 
Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing into heaven? For this same Jesus that went away shall so come in like manner. Wow. So we have 10 proofs. That's just in the 33 and a half years of the life of Jesus Christ that he was and is the Son of God. His virgin conception and birth, his presentation, his water baptism, his wilderness temptation, his sinless life, his miracles, his transfiguration, his sacrificial death, his resurrection, and his ascension. Folks, he did it for us. He did it for the house of Israel. And sometime I want to go into what is the relationship of the Spirit of God in connection with the Israel message that we believe, that we are the house of Israel. How is the house of Israel going to be rest restored, regathered, restored, redeemed? Regathered, restored, redeemed. How is that going to take place? By the Spirit of God. And the first church in the book of Acts was a Pentecostal church. And folks, we have must, we must get back to walking in the Spirit as a church and as individuals to see the salvation of our people, Israel as a whole, the church as the body of Christ, and as individuals and as members of our family, we must get back. We must. It's imperative that we get back to a Pentecostal apostolic experience with Jesus Christ, equivalent to Acts chapter 2 and walk in that because everything around us is seems to be going smash but how is it going to be restored zechariah tells us not by might not by human might it's not by power not by military power not by political power but by my spirit saith the lord I'd like to remind you once again concerning this book that we have, The Order of Melchizedek. I think it's going for an offering of $8, and we encourage you to take advantage of that. Also, our magazine that is free, and we offer that completely free. There is no subscription price, and I think that you will be blessed by these publications. But my purpose is not just to sell stuff. My purpose is to enrich your understanding and exalt the Lord Jesus Christ in our teaching because he is our prophet, our priest, and our coming king. God bless you.